Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 29. Yep, you notice that weird, awkward silence after? Because Dave's not here. <laughs> so we're missing his goofy banter in the beginning. But, no, not fear. Jim and Dave are both absent. They're traveling, training, cons, who knows? Dave's probably putting out 10 more releases of set in the next 15 minutes. But we have our trusty panel of Ping. How you doing this morning, Ping? I'm great. It's and actually... It's partly that, cloudy in Seattle. So right. How's your cardboard box, box holding up? Oh, it's, good. it's almost dry. It's almost dry. Did you get the new box I sent you? I bought a new stove, so I sent you the stove box. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sure I'll show up from the, uh, uh, post, the postal delivery guy or the UPS guy at some point here. But um, I'm kind of just huddled uh, partially underneath an eave in the little spot of sunshine that we do have here. Okay, good. Well, you're not whining, are you? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I'm not going to say, because some people don't have a box, you know, so you should be happy with... Well, I got a box and some lawn and some gravel and definitely lots of leaves. Awesome. So it's perfect. Yeah, you need leaves. Yes. They're like insulation. That's... Yes. And other things. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we have Eric with us today. Eric is one of our interns, uh, better known as Herbal, maybe. He's uh, with us, helping us out with uh, missing panel members today. How you doing, Eric? No, I'm doing well. So it's just us three, the three amigos, working on uh, our podcast. We got what do we got going on? Let's see. Let's talk about some of the happenings over the last month since our last podcast. Um, the SECTF report. You had a big play in that, Eric, in uh, helping us get that out. Yep. That's uh, been going quite well. There are literally thousands of downloads of the report that are at least registered, um, and I'm sure there's many more. Um, not registered. I hear that some have taken the report and posted on their own site, uh, passing it around. So it'll be hard to get direct numbers. But f- so far, uh, only being out a month or so, we've had we have a few thousand downloads of the report. A lot of good feedback from it. Uh, a lot of people um, writing in saying that they they've been using it in their corporations, uh, companies uh, as part of their security awareness. Um, we've had some people reach out for more information that were part of the. CTF, um, you know, one of the some of the companies that got called. Uh, so it's been going quite well. I think, uh, like last year, we're seeing some positive feedback from it, uh, which is always nice. So it's not uh, people aren't upset with the information released. As a matter of fact, even the companies um, that we've been contacted by are stating that they appreciate the work that we're doing and that the the information out there is helping them take a closer look at some things they may need to fix. So I'm kind of happy with uh, with the outcome of that. And that's on, uh, hosted on the social-engineer.com site, but there's links to it on the .org. So if you haven't gotten that report yet, you might want to jump over and take a download of that and read it. It will be up. We're not moving it anywhere, um, but that's downloaded without registration. Or if you want to help out, you can register and download the report too. Uh, along that line, last month we mentioned that, uh, Eric, you were going to give a speech on the report. Where was that located? Uh, that was going to be at the Phoenix, the local Phoenix 2600 meeting. Right, and then there was some kind of issue, right? One of the guys had a car accident and, uh, or something like that, and he couldn't make it, so that, that actually didn't happen last month. Yeah, as fate would have it, the, the guy that brings the projector shows up every single month and always has the projector, and there are hardly any presentations. And uh, the one time when we, need, when we actually did have a presentation, his car broke down en route, and uh, the projector never showed up. So um, there's been some, some talks on, on the message forums, and uh, we're going to try it again uh, this Friday. Uh, which is the the first Friday of the month um, in Phoenix at uh, Lola Coffee on Central. Uh, starts at six. Presentation should start around seven o'clock. 
Excellent. PM. So you'll be there giving the details of some of the details of the report uh, since you were there and actually in the competition. You got maybe a first person's view of some of the things that happened uh, at, at DEF CON 2. So that'll be, that'll be good. If anyone wants to check that out, um, you could check it out. That's uh, this Friday, actually. Yep. Um, yeah, it'll be a nice summary, uh, slide presentation summary of, of the data that we collected and analyzed for the, uh, for the official report that we put out. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, well, let's hope that the, he makes it there and there's no car problems this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're counting on you, Rax. Don't let us down. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else we got going on? So um, Brad Smith, um, everyone probably heard by now that listens to the podcast. If you haven't, Brad is also known as The Nurse. Uh, he's been around the cons and the circuit for eternity. And uh, he's he's probably one of the most loved guys I've ever met. He just um, really makes people feel good about themselves. He's a master at NLP, uh, social engineering. Well, the guy was given a speech down in Miami and had a, a, a stroke during the speech, actually, and was rushed to the hospital in Miami. It's been over a month now. It's been about 32 days since this occurred, and he's been uh, in and out of a coma presently now coming out of the coma, responding quite well to his family and his wife. Uh, well, as a community, we, we came together and, and tried to help Brad and his wife out, um, maybe um, display some of the costs that were going to to be occurred with her traveling from their home down to Miami, as well as the extended care that he had while being stuck down there. And uh, I got to say, I know I said this last month, um, that last month it was nowhere near where we are now. Uh, without any huge monster donations coming in, we're over eleven thousand dollars collected for Brad and his wife. Wow! Uh, yeah, I like every day when donations come in. I just got to. There's so many stories. So I don't want to single anybody out, so I'm not going to use names. But I, I'll just tell you this one story. I got this um, email the other night uh, from this gentleman uh, that owns a small company in Spain, and he tells me that he doesn't know Brad, but um, he listens to our podcast for the last couple years. And he heard, and he just started talking to a buddy of his about Brad, and it happened to be a guy from Russia who knew, knows Brad. And this guy just went up and down about how awesome Brad was and, and what kind of a guy he was. So this uh, guy from Spain, his company got together, and they, they, they generated $400 in donations um, that they sent in. And this is someone who doesn't even know the man. You know, never wow. met him. Yeah, doesn't know him. And they sent in over four hundred dollars in donations from the small company to to help Brad and his wife out. It's That's just awesome. yeah, it's story after story like that. You know, I mean, the DC Goon Squad, uh, the DefCon Goon Squad, they got together as a as a group of goons and they love Brad and they they donated five hundred bucks and you know it's just uh, all these uh, other companies and people and. Um, that know Brad, that have had some interaction with him, and then, of course, those who don't even know him but just heard the stories are coming to the site. They're leaving some really positive notes for, for Brad and Nina and, uh, and donating money uh, to help them out uh, to the tune of $11,000 so far. Uh, really amazing. Uh, the community just kind of took my uh, – just blew me away, really. Really blew me away with the generosity from everybody here. And Do, that, um, sorry, is, there a prog is there a prognosis for him right now, or are they just taking it uh, every day at a time? And Well, the, the latest update was um, uh, I, Nina and Brad are both in the medical field, so they, they kind of have a leg up maybe from the, the average person. And Nina knew that um, music might help stimulate some of the brain centers that were damaged by the stroke. So she's been using music and physically like moving his joints and and helping him stay active while laying in the bed for the last month um and and they've noticed the doctors have even said they've noticed some massive improvements he's now responding to her voice he's uh, listening and and you know doing like if she says show me two fingers he'll do that he's responding facially uh emotionally to to questions and answers uh, so they say that the prognosis looks good, like he will be able to have a recovery. They have not yet said full, partial, half, or anything that I've heard at least. But um, at least what we're seeing or what we're hearing from Nina is that the doctors are hopeful that the recovery will be quite quite good. Uh, the big problem now is that Brad has got to get out of the Miami hospital and be transported back home. Of course, this is not something that's going to happen on a plane you know, they're not going to be able to just put him on a commercial plane and fly him home uh, because he's still not mobile. 
So they're talking about things like um, air ambulance, which just to me seems like it would cost an amazing amount of money to do that. Yeah. Um, they're also trying to figure out some other methods, maybe doing it in stages, like getting them from Miami to Ohio, where they have lots of family. But right now, they're they're just trying to figure out how they're going to do that and and transport him. And um, that's probably where a lot of these donations are going to help out, is in those costs of getting him back to home so he can recover. I guess there's a really good facility close to his house, uh, within a hundred miles, that he can do some good recovery there that will help out. Um, so it's just you know it's just one of these stories, man. That it just it, you look at it, and you say, "Holy mackerel!" I mean, this is probably a guy who I don't you know if you saw him, you would never think this is the guy who's going to have a stroke. You know, he always looked healthy, uh, never appeared to be out of out of shape or anything, and then this happened. So kind of a wake up call for the for the rest of us. Yeah, he was one of the most energetic people I have ever known. And for someone his age, I don't want to say he's in his advanced years, but, you know, most of us know people who are in their 30s and 20s. He had more energy than any of us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and always so willing to help and just, you know, always very positive. Um, (laughs) And that really matched his lifestyle. And, you know, like you say, like someone who's that positive, who has that much energy, you know, you just don't know. Um, you know, you'd never think he would ever have a stroke. I always thought he'd go to 100 and probably, like, have to get hit by a train <laughs> before he died. Yeah, this guy is, like, another comment we got from a, from someone who donated was um, that, I guess, at last DEF CON, this family had brought one of their kids. In the, uh, so the, their son has, uh, he's autistic. And um, he was, you know, maybe feeling a little bit out of place or, or so at, uh, at DEF CON. And Brad, not not knowing them at all, just took time, saw the kid, maybe felt a little uncomfortable, pulled them aside, and just started talking to him. Really calmed him down, helped him to focus. And was that the kid that almost got arrested? I, I'm not sure if that was the that was the case or not. The family didn't tell me uh, that part of the story. All they said was that Brad took a lot of time to just talk to talk to him and kind of help him to see things differently, and it had a major effect on on this kid. Um, to where, you know, afterwards, like, he kept asking for Brad, and Brad would come by and try to find him and talk to him again. And, uh, you know, little things like that that this guy, I mean, you know, how many of us were there and maybe, you know, we have agendas, we have things we have to do, people we have to see, and we don't take time out to talk to complete strangers, especially in a way that shows compassion or kindness, and Brad did just that. Um, Really, uh, we probably could spend the next hour just talking about all the great things that Brad has done that we know about. Um... You know, I don't want to do that, but I just figured bring up a few things, let everyone know that he is making a good recovery and that if there's people out there that can donate more, I'm sure that it will help them in their transport home. And uh, just continually thank you for your support and all the kind words and the and the energy. It's more than just money. You know, I've had people in Miami. Uh, there was a guy who just went down and, and um, that, that lived close to Miami or in Miami and, he, and Nina needed a printer. So we bought one online. Uh, he went and picked it up at the store and took it to her apartment, set it up, delivered it, hooked it up to her computer, showed her how to use it. Um, you know, just little things like that. Just people taking dead, you know, half a day out of their life to go and help a complete stranger. Uh, really amazing. So um, we'll keep you updated uh, if we have any other news Um or anything else that, that we can, we just keep checking out the site. It's uh, on the social engineer site, uh, social en- social-engineer.org, or shortened as seorg.org, and you'll see a link there for Brad updates. Um, so that, that would be kind of cool uh, to keep checking that out and, and uh, let us know if you have any other questions. You can email me, and we'll post things as we can when we get updates from Nina. Okay, what else? Uh, what else do we got going on? Let's see. Our offsec uh, classes that we can promote. There are, well, actually, no reason to sign up now. It's happening as we speak. There's a class in St. Kitts that got filled up. Uh, really nice uh, PWB class in the middle of paradise, which I wish I was at right now since it's like 39 degrees where I'm at. And um, it seems nice and warm down there. But uh, also all classes uh, uh, coming up, and, and there's one in the um, U.K. that's already full, so we won't have any more sign-ups for that. And uh, you could keep checking out the Offsec site for any future trainings that will be happening. And then, of course, uh, you know, drum roll, please. Oh, wait, Dave's not here. Dave, I miss you, Dave. I can't believe I'm ever going to say that so publicly. We'll 
Thank or you. Something else. I just Dave always has the sound <laughs> effects. I miss the guy. I didn't think I'd ever say those words that would come out of my mouth. I miss Dave Kennedy. Whew. I'm gonna have to edit that out of the podcast, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the SE training, the Social Engineering for Penetration Tester training, is launched and now taking registrations and signups. We already have people signed up and registered and paid for coming to the class in Seattle. Uh, really excited about that. Uh, so we have our three classes. We got Seattle in March. We have the UK, um, Bristol area in April, and then already signed for Black Hat uh, Vegas in July. And uh, this is quite amazing if you ask me. Um, the Black Hat folks, thank you, Ping, have offered us 10 free briefing passes per class. So the first 10 people that sign up for Seattle and the first 10 people that sign up for UK will be getting a free pass to all the briefings at Black Hat. That's kind of an amazing deal. I mean, right now I feel like there should be like a big, huge round of applause. And again, Dave's not here. Well, and I want to add that the pass is good through 2013. So you can use it at USA or any of the other satellite events like in Europe or D.C. or Middle East if you can't make it to USA. But USA is our big flagship event and everyone wants to be there. It's the place to be. That is ridiculous. So um, that's new. We didn't have that before then. So, of course, uh, if you're listening to people who already paid, you'll be getting one of those. And then we'll have more passes uh, for those who – people who sign up the first 10 for each class. So I would say get in early because you know what's going to happen when this hits the hits the news. People are going to be wanting those passes. I mean that's, that's like uh, – what is that, $2,000? Savings yep. per person. Yep. That's a. Yep. That's, like that's a, amazing. That's a huge deal. Can I sign up for myself and then take one pass? Uh, well, you know, as a trainer at the event, you do get in for free. That isn't our contractual agreement. Oh, that's true. But I was thinking that I can resell it. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. I'm just kidding. You can, sell, you can resell your pass as a trainer. We'll take away your badge, and then you won't be able to attend the briefings. Oh, dang. <laughs> okay, so I, obviously I can't do that. Up, give up Herbal's pass. So I have actual 10 passes per class that I have to give away. Hey. So. You have 11. You, Eric, Herbal doesn't need to go. That's true. Uh, so I, can give what? Up, I can give up Eric's. Eric, I'm How did sorry. this happen? You're out. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're I'm fired done. again. Okay. 2600 is canceled. Sorry. I'm done. Oh, Goodbye. Man. They're going to be a riot there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this, I'm sure six people will be upset. <laughs> six people. Come on now. Don't sell yourself short. Um, so if you want any more information on the training, social-engineer.com. There's a training tab there. We have all the details on the class dates, times. Uh, you can register for that class uh, right there on the site. And then um, and we'll let you know if you're one of the first 10. Uh, if you have any questions on that, feel free to email me. Shoot me an email. And uh, thanks again to Black Hat for this great offer. I think that will really uh, really help out a lot of the people that are signing up. Okay, so let's see. What else do we have going on? See, without Dave here, we can't really talk about the set updates, although there was one today that updated some problems with the Java applet attack that is now fixed. And I just tested that, and that is working quite well. Um, so there is a new set update. If you haven't got that yet, you can just update it through uh, the set menu. And I think that's all I got to really promote. Um, let's talk a little bit about our music, intro music. If you liked it, you want to check out Dual Core, dualcoremusic.com. That guy's pretty awesome. Wrote that song uh, called Trust Me Just For Us for the Social Engineer podcast. And uh, he gives it away for free at the website. So if you want it unbroken, I know we have part of it in the intro, part of it in the inclusion. If you want it unbroken, you can download it from dualcoremusic.com for free. Uh, he gives it out there. So that'd be kind of cool if you want to check that out. Plus, he has a couple other albums up there, all which rock pretty much. So you can uh, buy them from him and keep supporting his work there. And since uh, Dave's not here, I can honestly mention that um, Dual Core actually spanked Dave bad in the last all class they took together at Black Hat Vegas last year and uh, Dave was crying because he got beat by by dual core so the guy's not just a rapper he's actually really 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 awesome at exploitation too so uh, he's got many talents that we might not know about uh, spy associates also 
another sponsor of ours that continually sends us some pretty cool gear that we get to test out and talk about. So spyassociates.com. They got everything on there. I mean, cameras and every kind of device you can imagine, listening devices, GPS trackers. Uh, you, if you could think of it, it's there. Um, Dave is trying, constantly trying to make me get some night vision goggles so he can test them out. So uh, maybe one day we'll get some night vision goggles. I'm not sure why he wants to test them out, but that might be cool. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about our guest that we're going to have coming on shortly. Brad Barker is our guest. Brad is, uh, if you heard the name before, you might have seen him on Discovery Channel. Um, Brad has been on multiple TV shows. Um, they're probably the one that's most recent that you might have heard about is Kidnap and Rescue. He um, is featured on uh, a show there. It's about his company, Halo Corp, the Halo Corporation. These are ex-commando types that uh, specialize in um, basically rescuing people that have been kidnapped, maybe taken out of the country uh, and, and brought to a foreign country. And these guys go in, use... Um, of course, military methods, but also social engineering methods in order to locate their targets and save them from danger. So a little different than a lot of our podcasts where we talk about maybe soft skills. Uh, these these skills are definitely um, uh, combat tested for, for reality. And we'll be talking to Brad now as we get him on to, to discuss the Halo Corporation. Okay, so we're here with our guest today is Brad Barker from the Halo Corporation. How are you doing this morning, Brad? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, so maybe to start off, just since people might not know a lot about what it is that you do, just, just kind of give us some background. What What is it that Halo Corporation does? The Halo Corporation is a group of former special operations and intelligence personnel, largely uh, with a, a background in uh, deploying assets into areas of war and conflict around the world. And uh, we do this with three divisions. We've got a, a field operations division where we take individuals with backgrounds from uh, uh, basic counterterrorism threat mitigation and mass casualty expertise all the way to uh, tactical combat casualty care medics that can help in uh, mass casualty events, uh, crisis mitigation. Uh, we got our start right after Hurricane Katrina. And now we operate globally with the three divisions, field operations, uh, science and technology, and training and education. We're headquartered here in San Diego. And uh, So what is it that you actually did, like let's say for Hurricane Katrina? You mentioned you were, you were there for that. So uh, the operators uh, from HALO deployed right after uh, the uh, hurricane hit, and much of the folks who deployed to that event, had a, a Navy Special Warfare uh, background and obviously knew how to live in austere environments and not only and not only thrive, but help others. And this was done through a combination of uh, boots on the ground uh, and what we refer to now as medical intelligence, and that's really understanding the, the event itself, uh, the, where all the assets were what the government was doing on the local, state, and federal side, and then identifying the critical gaps, and then filling those gaps with whatever is needed. What we found most of all uh, in events like Haiti, which uh, Katrina was just in 2005, and Haiti was the largest event uh, that we've done since then, um, the issues that where the wheels really fall off this uh, vehicle is in the communication aspect. Mm. Uh, if you have um, from Katrina to Haiti, there's never a, a, a gap in, in people trying to respond or, or there's no lack of willingness to, to help others where, where the thing really breaks down is because people don't know where their assets are. Uh, you don't have the communication. You have multiple response agencies, NGOs, U.S. and other government uh, response organizations that are coming, and they don't coordinate and collaborate with each other, and it's largely because they're on different communication standards. And as with any relationship of any kind, whether it's two people or governments working together, uh, if you don't have the communication, then you don't have the, the coordination, and of course, then there's no, there's no collaboration. Okay, so like where I know you from is I saw uh, a TV show on Discovery Channel called uh, Kidnap and Rescue. And, and on that show, it talked about how your corporation 
uh, the Halo Corporation actually will be used or be asked to save people who've been kidnapped, maybe taken out of this country into a foreign country, and, and then you guys are, are deployed in order to go save uh, save people in those situations. Is that a large part of your, your business also? Overall, we do have the capabilities operating in Mexico. It's a, um, a smaller portion of what our field operations division does. It just happens to be what Discovery Channel thinks uh, would have made good TV. <laughs> and uh, if, you'll, if you'll remember on um, Easter Sunday 2009, a very significant uh, maritime incident right off the Gulf of Aden where the Maersk, Alabama was taken hostage by Somali pirates. Uh, there was a, uh, an event there, uh, five shots, four kills, and one uh, critically wounded and then um, and then taken in for questioning. This was a this was a pretty big deal for. Um, it was the first time a U.S. flagged vessel had been taken by pirates since Jefferson was president. So it was a pretty significant event here in the U.S. And uh, because of some of the work that we do in Mexico uh, with uh, hostage negotiation and. Uh, recovering and rescuing Americans that have been forcibly taken and repatriating them into the U.S. and reuniting with their families. The uh, State Department is aware of what we do and, and we share with them our operations and ask for permission and help uh, from U.S. federal agencies when necessary. So they're aware of our operations and when the Maersk Alabama went down, a lot of that operation was still classified. And uh, there was a, a State Department annual conference which I was asked to, to uh, keynote based on the whole economic impact of kidnap for ransom, hostage terrorism, kidnap for extortion. And uh, I discussed that. And, and after that event, um, I met several folks from uh, Discovery Channel who actually had some of the best questions in the entire, in the entire seminar. And, um, and we provided them a bunch of information for a documentary that they were doing on kidnapping. And um, an hour-long show turned into a, turned into a 10-episode uh, documentary series, which has been um, a very interesting thing for us because most of the folks that work for Halo spent most of their career avoiding cameras. <laughs> and now uh, here we are with a, with a television show, and um, we went back and forth on whether or not that was uh, the right thing to do. And the final analysis is that many of the folks in the United States that, that watched Discovery Channel didn't even know that an organization like ours existed or that anything that we do is even legal. So when they found out about the work that we do, uh, some of the folks that did have some type of crisis event, whether it be a forcibly taken child or a high net worth individual or somebody who has uh, some type of um, corporate responsibility to travel into a high risk transit zone, uh, they now have resources in addition to what U.S. law enforcement can uh, deploy. Uh, the gap, as I mentioned earlier, that we exist to fill are the jurisdictional boundaries in the U.S. law enforcement construct, the rules of engagement issues that can sometimes hinder uh, what the law enforcement and uh, other communities are able to, to bring to the, to the mitigation effort. And then, of course, you've got international borders where, again, the whole thing goes pear-shaped uh, because there's very – the U.S. national security construct is limited as to what it can do for private individuals outside of the U.S. Some of the areas where we operate are sovereign nations. And um, private organizations like ours and, and consultants that we work with uh, allow us to be able to do a lot more uh, because we don't have the legal constraints that uh, government employees do. See, and, and what, what interested me, I guess, in kind of watching that show that's on Discovery Channel, I, I was one of those Americans that did not realize <laughs> that there was corporations who actually do this type of work legally. <laughs> um, so to watch that and kind of see what you guys do, I started to think to myself, there has to be a large level of, of social engineering. Um, that is used. I can't imagine that you guys just go to a foreign country, start kicking in doors with automatic weapons, and 
and uh, you know, go and Jack Bauer on them to get information out of them. Um, maybe you do. I don't know if you want to tell us that, but <laughs> I would imagine that, that some of the way you gather information from people in, in foreign countries when you're looking for someone who's been kidnapped is is through pretexting or or do you do you like do you have um, people you plant in organizations as spies or do you have people that go in as not as Halo uh, you know acting as a reporter or somebody else to try to gather information from from locals or from people you suspect have been part of the kidnapping? Well, first the folks at Discovery Channel, I have to give them a whole lot of credit, in particularly the production company that put it all together, because they made us look a lot cooler than we really are. So um, <laughs> we, uh, we appreciate that. And uh, again, they're trying to take operations that we've conducted uh, that take, you know, there's one case on there that, that took years uh, to un- uncover the correct amount of actionable intelligence that would allow us to to deploy assets based on solid and unchanging data. And then some of the uh, operations that we have conducted recently just took a, a matter of hours for us to collect the intel and then and then deploy, and uh, the entire operation was just a matter of days. So uh, they have to take these big complex operations that have a lot of moving parts and a lot of personalities and a lot of multi-jurisdictional uh, interoperability, and then they have to emulsify that into a 42-minute show uh, to leave room for advertising, which is, quite frankly, what they're in business to do: is uh, you know sell insurance and uh, and detergent. <laughs> and um, the the operations, any operation, any concept of operation that we are going to put forth for our clients, for our government, for our family is all going to be based on intel. It is the, like um, the, any successful real estate agent is going to tell you that to buy the property based on location, location, location. Any of the operations that we or anybody like us is going to, is going to do is based on intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. It is the most critical element in these operations and it also quite frankly, takes the longest to, uh, to obtain. And there's many different ways that we gather this intel. And we live in a time right now where uh, I call it the information renaissance. We just have so much gadgetry, so much access to information and data from a bunch of different sources without even pulling our butt off the chair. Uh, it's amazing what you can do with, with search engines. Yep. And as you well know, uh, there are a lot of tools out there that are, are kitted so that intelligence research analysts and operators and uh, folks on our side that um, are helping us get this data, uh, there's so many different ways that you can get the raw data and then display it in a way that is going to be current and relevant to the operation that we're currently running. So technology as a force multiplier is one of the greatest assets that allows us to do what we do. Um, Obviously, um, the use of technology is something that's new, but everything that we're doing with the technology is just automating some of the more traditional uh, Cold War concepts of social engineering, elicitation, and, and pretexting, as you mentioned, and uh, being able to understand through virtual means what your target might be, uh, refute any of the uh, rat lines and rabbit holes that you might disappear down, uh, wasting time and assets and energy, being able to use technology to eliminate potential targets so that you can clearly define the true target and the true path to uh, a positive operation or extraction. Unless you clearly define the target, there's no way you can hit the bullseye. And we are paid uh, and contracted to hit the bullseye as frequently as we possibly can. And we can't even put our finger on the trigger until we know where the target is and we've clearly defined it. So do you, do you, all, do you um, just obtain people or do you also get hired to go after objects or um, 
possessions that people may have lost or had stolen? Um, both. Uh, the overwhelming majority of what we do is looking for missing persons. Uh, but there's a lot of what we do that is um, asset tracking or recovery of assets. And that can be anything that you deem as valuable. Uh, and of course, people being the most valuable. And the process of going through um, all of this target selection is is very much the same. Right. Okay. Um, so that that's yeah, that's interesting. I was wondering if it was just um, if it was just people or or if it was uh, possessions too, because I would imagine that it's got to be a little easier to do information gathering um, on people than it is on trying to find an object. It's Brad. much easier. Yes. Yes, sir. So what uh, what uh, has there ever been a situation where you haven't been able to recover um, the, the kidnapped victim, for instance? Thankfully, we've got a really good success rate. Uh, there hasn't been an operation where we we didn't complete it in a way uh, that um, uh, that was possible. In in some instances, it didn't go exactly the way we wanted it. It, it it rarely does. Um, but the reason that we have such a good success rate is because we spend so much time on the front side, uh, sort of front loading the intel. We can't, um, we will say no to people if we don't believe we can't solve their problem. If um, at the end of the day, we, we, run a, we run a business. So, we do. We can't do business if we uh, if they don't have something that we we can do. Uh, there's no fit. So, largely, when our phone rings, they never call to say, "Hey, Brad, happy birthday," or "How are the Chargers doing?" Usually, uh, someone will call because they are experiencing potentially the worst day in their life. So right. we have to be able to navigate uh, a very emotional. Uh, scenario and understand that the client, even on our best day, even on our best day, will have about 20% of the information that we need. Do they ever just plain lie to you instead of giving you information or lack of information, just give you outright incorrect information? There's been a few instances where we are better uh, humanters than they are liars. And we've been able to uncover the fact that they were being disingenuous. And of course, in our belief here, how things begin is usually how they end. And how you do anything is how you do everything. So if they're going to lie to us uh, at the beginning, then they could put the entire operation or our operators at risk. So we'll usually bounce in a situation where where we think that there's different versions of the truth. Now, we'll be patient and we'll spend a fair amount of time making sure that we're, uh, that what we're feeling is, is actually relevant. But some people um, are pretty good at this kind of thing, so uh, it, it, can get, it can get taxing. Unfortunately, with this 80-20 rule, uh, many of the people that we have uh, worked with over the years on our best day, we can hope for about 20% of the data. Uh, so being able to solve 100% of the problem with 20% of the data, the balance is the responsibility of, of the folks that will data mine and gather the, the intelligence. And, and that, that, is, that is why the intel side is so top heavy. What, what's the, um, the main, I mean, maybe you can give us like three or four or five of uh, the reasons why people might might be kidnapped. I mean, I'm assuming probably the largest is for money. Yeah. Uh, well, what what other reasons are people usually taken for? Well, there's um obviously kidnap for ransom forever was uh, was the main reason. Uh, it's it's a financial operation. The the target is a bag of money, and in years past, uh, you know, this kidnapping 
issue is is not new. For for decades, this has been this has been happening in all around the world, and it was largely a function of money. Uh, you you kidnap someone, then you ask for a certain amount of money, you negotiate, and then you return the person and you get the money. Well, what has been happening more recently? Uh, we've seen a significant paradigm shift in thinking, and around 2005, 2006, where uh, people are kidnapping others for retributive action, uh, where it's uh, a form of extortion. I need you to do this business-wise or uh, political for political reasons, and if you don't, then I'm going to take your spouse, or I'm going to take your children, or I'm going to take you. And people are going to respond psychologically and mentally. Uh, many people would prefer to be the victim than for someone that they care about uh, to be the victim because it just impacts you so much more emotionally because uh, there's so many levels of, of responsibility there. Uh, the Another um, uh, pretty common uh, uh, kidnapping is th for the purposes of human trafficking or sex trafficking as we refer to it. Uh, it, it used to be um, you could kidnap someone for ransom. Speaking of ransoms, what is the, what's like the average ransom these days if, for, for kidnapping? It, it, runs, it runs the gamut. I mean, it, they will Depending on what for, country and everything? It's what country, it's what organization, whether it's an organized crime syndicate or just a street gang, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's sex trafficking, whether, what are the means, uh, the financial means of the, of the victim's family. Is this person uh, a high-ranking person in a, in a corporation? Does this person have a kidnap and ransom policy? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff about us um, that are uh, factors in what your ransom will be, a lot of that uh, is on a database somewhere, and that database can be compromised. And those, uh, those factors can then be uh, used to create a profile, and that profile is then used to exploit the target. The, um, the process of uh, target selection of how visible somebody is and how val valuable someone is and how vulnerable someone is has been a, a long-standing uh, uh, has been a long long-standing criteria of target selection. There's no change in the process of target selection these days. It's just been web enabled, and now with a bunch of different hacking tools that are commercial off the shelf, or if someone wants to engage uh, at a higher level. Uh, to hack themselves to, down to the, to the code level, uh, the process of target selection is largely the same. It's just much faster because they're using technology uh, to do their thinking for them. And uh, geographically, they don't have to leave their desk. Uh, so they do, you actually, do you actually employ like hackers, social engineers, and whatnot to do a lot of the legwork up front for you? Yes. This is a, a rather new side of... Uh, of our emerging a business model because as the as the bad guys come up with new illicit and nefarious ways to perpetrate crimes the, the the process and the crime and what it is they do is as old as time itself but the method of operation and how that is evolving using technology as the force multiplier that is is constantly changing and organizations like ours uh, our belief is that if we don't become early adopters of this type of technology and understand the method of operation and break it down and find out where the holes are, uh, we can't develop a countermeasure. How can you develop a countermeasure for something you know little or nothing about? So what we bring to the table is the, the historical perspective on how these folks go through the process of target selection. And then we work with some of the best and brightest minds um, on how to uh, unwind this and, and be able to have the operation come with its safest and most reasonable outcome, playing by the rules that the bad guys set. Because unfortunately, the good guys are always first to act. It's the bad guys that, uh, that are always the, 
uh, the primary catalyst, and yeah. we will always be playing catch up. You know what? What I tend to agree with you on in our industry. I mean, of course, we're in completely different industries, but um, you know, to say sometimes we'll be called in to help a company who's been breached, uh, or to test a company that might be a threat of being breached. And uh, one of the biggest problems that we have is that the bad guys don't have rules. They don't have laws that limit them. They don't have any of the problems uh, that, that they have to follow, like say, oh, I can't attack this server at, you know, before 5 p.m. because it's a production server. Um, whereas, you know, with, with us as, as uh, legitimate penetration testers or legitimate social engineers, uh, when you get contracted by a company, there's so many limitations. And then there's also federal law. You know what we can and can't do. You can't tap people's phones. You can't record certain conversations. You, know, you can't do these things, and that limits our ability to sometimes really save or secure a company because we're not allowed to use the means that the bad guys use. Do you guys experience the same uh, kind of problems when it comes to saving people from a kidnap situation? It almost sounds like you are reading directly out of one of our after action reports. It's the same things that make you take a big aspirin are the same things that give us a headache as well. Uh, and, and I believe that uh, we, are in, we are in different industries, but our, our method of operation conceptually is, is largely the same. Let me, let me ask you a quick question. When, if someone was to go missing, uh, based on your common knowledge of, of kidnapping or missing persons cases, when can you officially engage law enforcement that someone has gone missing? I don't, I don't actually know the answer, but I'm going to take a guess. It's got to be at least 24 to 48 hours. I you're, say 48. You're, you're right on the money. Depending on what state you live in, it can be between 24, 48, even 72 hours before you can engage our our arguably very taxed law enforcement community. That seems so right. long. I mean, why Why is it, I mean, like, like, 24 hours, I understand, like, a kid runs away from home or something, but 72 hours, I mean, so much could happen in that time. It's well, true. I, why, again, why? I, I, sort of, yeah, I sort of mentioned earlier, you kind of have to, in, in some cases, you have to suspend some level of common sense. And the short answer without running down a rat hole is... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of people might go missing, quote-unquote missing, from your perspective. But some of these people just left. Some of these people don't want to be found. Some of these people took a vacation or just peaced out for whatever reason. Or, you know, there's a, a, a reason for them to go away. They just didn't, quote-unquote, check with you. And, um, and so that exists so that you don't tax an already pretty significantly taxed national security construct. So if that is the rule... Let's look at something else that is pretty much common knowledge. When are the most critical hours uh, of recovering someone in a kidnapping? What are the most critical hours? I would say the first 24. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's also common sense. And everybody who does this sort of work, whether they be local, state, or federal agents, they will tell you that the, the most precious hours uh, are the first ones. If And it dramatically affects the percentage chance of a, a safe and healthy healthy uh, recovery uh, if, if you don't get off the X at the very beginning. So if, if, if we agree that, that, that the uh, regulatory compliance says, okay, you can't officially call a, a, a kidnapping a kidnapping for the first 24 hours, yet the subject matter experts are saying that the most critical hours are the first 24, that gap right there defines our model. Now, when you were talking earlier about uh, regulations and working with law enforcement and as a complement to law enforcement, th that was primarily uh, here in the states. Now, what about when you have engagements or if you have uh, individuals you need to retrieve from foreign countries? Do you work with those foreign governments uh, ahead of time? Do you alert them that you're coming? Um, do, you, do you utilize their information sources to help you as to what you're doing or do you just go in sort of for lack of a better term commando style and and extract the you know the victim or how, how does that work okay. and is it a, and does it work differently for for every country do you have ongoing relationships with specific countries so in the u.s uh, we have 
arguably one of the best national security processes in the world. Uh, HALO exists and we operate in the United States, but we are much more effective outside of the U.S. The overwhelming majority of our operations are outside of the continental U.S. And when we get called and mobilized, we're usually getting on a plane. Now, this is largely because when people grab someone, either let's say an American that is, that is going to be taken, uh, being taken over a border, or being taken uh, across a border is mostly uh, a safety and security issue for the individual perpetrating the crime. Uh, because there's not a lot of critical infrastructure and the law enforcement networks outside of the U.S., uh, their capability and capacity to respond falls off uh, uh, measurably. Uh, the other issue is when you've got Americans or clients of ours that exist in, in other countries that are traveling through high-risk transit zones or austere environments for whatever reason, uh, they become a target because their vulnerability and their threat profile spikes. So they could be taken then. So uh, we will then be called to respond in another country. Now, uh, to answer Eric's question, uh, it's different in each country because every country has different, so different sovereign laws on how they're going to deal with organizations like ours. And we work with US uh, diplomatic top cover so that we can uh, work collaboratively for the repatriation of the, of the American citizen into the U.S., they, HALO doesn't have a dog in that fight. We don't, we don't do that kind of work. That's a, that's a governmental function uh, to return someone to the U.S. We're not going to sneak them in. We're going we're to come right in the front door and everybody's going to know about it, who needs to know about it, uh, so that we can process them back into, back into the country. Now, some countries where we operate have uh, dramatically less critical infrastructure and uh, less law enforcement or support capability that we're going to need. And in these types of scenarios, then, then yeah, we will, we will operate in that region unaided. Are there any countries or regions you won't go into? Uh, we are currently operating in, uh, in areas that are deemed to be uh, the most lawless and the most chaotic and the most dangerous in the world. So when we're talking about assets, I want to know if you utilize any honey traps. <laughs> of course. There is, I don't care what level of training you think you have, a couple of drinks and a ferociously attractive girl mm -hmm. will, <laughs> I will, will give you the launch codes. <laughs> it's, it's, just, uh, it's just human nature. Uh, that is, that is the, the biggest weakness of, uh, of some of the guys out there in positions of trust uh, in corporations and unfortunately governments. Yeah, we are kind of stupid, aren't we, when it comes to that kind of stuff? Uh, if you can, uh, if you can get a pretty girl to understand how to manipulate a conversation on three things: sports, food, and sex, you can get that guy to you can get that guy to be talking about talking to you for hours. Uh, and giving you so many uh, breadcrumbs of data, uh, they, they make it so much easier. Not to, not to generalize, but every single time. <laughs> the girl is uh, <laughs> always, always better than, uh, than the guy, depending, yeah. on the, depending on the target. We're talking about the target being male, of course. If you ever so, need an asset, I can rent out Eric to you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I've, I've heard I'm your a, reputation, Eric. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm available for undercover operations. Um, on, on, on that level, I have another question. Then, um, do you, do you have do you use uh, just nor, not not necessarily like attractive women, but women or men as um, uh, lack of better word spies, like to infiltrate? Like you you mentioned before that some of your gigs might take a year, might take longer. Uh, to actually close the case, find the person, and, and get them home. So in that year time, do you, do you send people into a country, uh, infiltrate a gang organization, become part of their memberships, um, you know, live a lifestyle to get information that feeds back to you guys? Sure. That is not anything that, that we've ever done. Most of the cases that we get called into are, are pretty short fuse. They're uh, what we refer to as uh, uh, rapid response 
Uh, and um, we're more or less like a like a firehouse. Uh, we have uh, capable people that are on standby. Then the then the fire alarm goes off, and and we bring the right people and the right gear uh, based on the threat uh, to put out the fire. So, um, I'm, I'm you know listening to all the things that you do. Obviously, to me, it sounds very close to you know. Of course, your danger level is a lot more. We're getting hired by corporations to test their security, not you know, use weapons to go save people from, you know, cartels or gangs. But I'm curious if um, you give your employees or if your employees attend any type of like social engineering or persuasion or manipulation kind of training, uh, or, or is that all internal? Well, um, uh, it's, it's twofold. <clears throat> we, uh, we're perpetually uh, taking the role of a student. Uh, because the threat environment and the area of operation is constantly changing, uh, especially with the way modern technology is being utilized on a regular basis. Uh, using Google Earth for geospatial imaging, all the different GPS tracking. I mean, I challenge you to find a new phone at any one of the cell phone carriers that doesn't have a GPS already in it, that doesn't have some kind of um, you know, mapping solution or social network app that is GPS enabled already in it for free. So the, the, the types of commercial off the shelf uh, uh, technological solutions that just 10 years ago were, were only available to people in the intelligence community or in the elite law enforcement community or in the military, these assets are now available to, to kids. And this network is already deployed. It's already, you didn't have to invest in it. Uh, you, didn't, you don't have to uh, pay for its repair if it goes down. And if something happens to your device, you can pull into one of a million uh, retail stores and get a brand new one. We teach a lot of these classes. At the same time, we also attend a lot of these classes because this is a very new and emerging method of training, what we're talking about right now. And there are no PhDs offered in, in this type of this is cyberspace is now not a place that you can point to on a map geographically, but it is a place where you can go and it is a place where you can be harmed and it is a place where you can even be murdered, as we have realized in just the past three weeks <clears throat> between the, the standoff between the Zeta drug cartel, arguably one of the most capable organized crime syndicates in history, and Anonymous, who is a, a very well-known uh, collective of some of the most technologically proficient individuals in the world. So you've got these two incredibly prolific groups are now fighting a war with casualties, with a body count, and this war is being fought, by and large, in the cloud. And, and that let that let that touch you for a second. This has happened, and it's it's not going to end. Yeah. So Brad, you, you mentioned um, uh, some of the, the, the toys and, and cool technologies and whatnot that you get to play with. Can you tell us about any of the really cool sort of spy toys that you might have or, you know, anything that's really technologically advanced um, that you guys get well, to play with? Sure. Um, you know... <laughs> A lot of what everybody has seen in, excuse me, in Hollywood and on TV um, over the last several years, a, a lot of that stuff exists. Um, any of the unmanned aerial vehicles that allow us to, to see things from a distance, uh, virtually invisibly, uh, all of that stuff is available. Uh, robotics, underwater vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones. Uh, that, uh, that film and broadcast and basically stream video in ultraviolet, infrared, hyperspectral, thermal imagery that can be taken from any lens that exists today. We can take that technology and we can put it aloft. In a wow. And, uh, and everything from facial recognition software analytics all the way to license plate readers uh, to what I believe is one of the coolest and more emerging technologies, and that is gait analysis. So that is basically, think of a retina scan. Uh, we all have a, a uniquely occurring 
a retina blood vessel pattern uh, that allows us to be a unique identifier. Uh, one of the other unique identifiers that we all have is how we walk. How oh, yeah. The human, <laughs> how the human form goes through space and time is called your gait, how, how you walk. And um, if, if I wanted to get your retina scan, Eric, you and I would have to be pretty intimate. Yep. <laughs> you'd, know, you'd know I was doing it. But I can film you from 500 yards away and watch you walk or run in any axis, uh, directly to me, off axis, in any plane. Your body can only interoperate with itself so many different ways uh, because of how long your arms are, where your elbow is in relation to your arm, where your knees are, your hips, and how you walk and your posture and everything is a unique identifier. Uh, the British intelligence agencies have taken this to a science and it is very difficult to defeat this. And they are deploying this through their prison systems. And um, in the UK, it has the highest CC uh, in London. It is the highest CCTV density anywhere in the world except for one location in the world. Can you guess where that one location of the highest CCTV density might be? Washington, D.C.? Okay, good guess, but no. Not by a long shot. Mm, New York City. Nope. I'm going to guess it's nowhere in America. It's Disneyland. Huh. Uh. Oh... Wow. So, so not only do you have the deployed CCTV assets and a, a, a mesh network where that place is 100% covered by surveillance cameras and an operations center in Burbank that watches it all from a whole bunch of three-letter agencies that are retired, but you have every single person that goes there practically carries a mobile camera with them because they're on vacation. So you have the public-private partnership of just always on ubiquitous surveillance happening in every regard. Anytime you ever see a kid fall and skin their knee, all of a sudden you've got this Mario Andretti pit crew that comes out of nowhere and sweeps them, quote unquote, off stage because you can't have a kid skinning their knee on the happiest place on earth. I'm just curious, though, um, you brought up something that I haven't yet done any research on, so I'm very interested in this. Um, what is it that they're profiling with a person's gait? Is it, is it their personality? Is it their intentions? What, what's the profile? So um, basically it's the primary intelligence node. Uh, it's what you are. It, it's the, the unique identifier of who that person is. Not yet are you applying what they might be doing or why are they there. Uh, that right there is more predictive profiling analytics, which is, which is a, a separate but related conversation. Just being able to have a unique identifier, like your thumbprint or your uh, license plate or your face for racial rec facial recognition software, your retina. Well, now we have something that is much less invasive. All of the other ones that I mentioned earlier are somewhat intimate. I have to almost ask you, hey, Chris, can you open your eye real wide, put your chin right here, and stand by for one second. Okay, all right, thank you. Now, now you and I are, you know, we've met. We've had the opportunity to, to meet, establish a little bit of rapport, and then I'm going to scan your retina, if you please. With, with a gait analysis, I can see who you are, and based on knowing who you are, I can then do all kinds of things. But, but you're uh, telling that a gait is as unique as a retina? Yes. It's a unique identifier. I mean, How, each, so I, like, I'm just, I don't know. I, wow. I got I to gotta actually research this. It, it, this, this is kind of uh, something brand new to me. You know, I've done a lot of research in the micro expressions, body language, but this gate is, is, uh, is pretty interesting. It is. I'd love to provide for you uh, some of the research that we're working with and some of the places where it's actually deployed. And uh, the, the chink in the armor right now is that there just isn't a huge repository of people's gates uh, that you can uh, be referencing in order to find out who this person is. So uh, it's being piloted in the, uh, in the corrections, uh, the correction systems in the UK. So uh, I will be able to provide for, for you and your podcast subscribers the, uh, the data on this so they can begin their own due diligence. But yes, this is seriously, this would be very interesting to myself and probably a lot of our listeners. That, 
Uh, that sounds like a whole new area that I yeah, probably sure. would have to research. If you could profile a person, um, what well, you're saying, identify. Now, the gate, does it tell you anything about um, are, are the scientists that are researching this? Are they saying that the gate will tell you anything about a person's intentions or moods or emotional state? Or is it just that you can identify a person from video based on their, on their type of walk? Sure. So um, the uh, being able to anticipate somebody's intentions is more what we call predictive profiling analytics, and there is a whole bunch of software out there that that can that can do that. But what you need is the is the entry point. Is, you want to be able to do with predictive profiling is you have to have a database of actuarial data of things that happened in history, so that you can look at the trends and then use that data to say, okay, well, when this factor and that factor together, this is usually the outcome. You know, nine times out of ten, and 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 that type of stuff is just factors down to to basic arithmetic. If you do not have the the entry point, which is which is the subject, which is the unique identifier, then the, that whole process can't begin. That first domino uh, can't be toppled in order for the rest of the whole machine to, to spin into life. So the gate is just the unique identifier of who that individual is. So you're not being able to pretext uh, anything other than uh, who they are. And I'm assuming that that gate uh, identification is something that uh, you can't really do with just visually, right? I mean, it has to be computer aided, or is this something that you can train yourself to do uh, just by looking at somebody? No, you need gear. That's what uh, I thought. You, you need gear. Uh, the, the the power behind the gate analysis is is the software. This software, uh, open standards, open architecture, not to be confused with open source but an open standard, an open architecture so that I can use a Pelco camera or a Sony camera or, or a Zeiss lens or, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the, the camera is or the lens is. Because, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, I'm, I'm kind of in my mind, I guess, maybe comparing this to like the study of, um, of micro facial expressions. Uh, sure. You know, a, a micro expression is a 1 25th of a second um, display of emotion. Uh, a muscular movement that the, that is uh, translated from emotion that you might be feeling, um, unlike the TV shows, you know, it's not necessarily a hundred percent accurate for a person without training to be able to notice those expressions. Normally, what we'll notice is the macro expressions. So, you know, you walk up to someone and you see them smile and you think that they're happy, but you didn't notice that when they saw you, they had a look of disgust on their face because it was only one twenty-fifth of a second. Now, if you're trained, you might be able to pick up some of those subtle hints, uh, depending on your emotional state and your focus at the time. Uh, but, of course, there is software to enhance that. So I'm just wondering if as we become more understanding of this science, if there'll be certain tells in a person's gait that will allow us to identify more about that person, not just who they are, but something about that person and maybe their emotional state or their intentions based sure. on the style of their walk. Well, just as you, as you just gave an analogy of um, you know, the, the person who uses the macro expressions like the smile or the frown or surprise or, or whatever, that is, is something that a lot of folks are are using the micro expressions. Obviously, is is something where you're going to have to drill down, and there's a, a higher level of training. Now, the same thing applies for gait. Uh, if you uh, look at some of the folks who are advanced in the martial arts community, they refer to it as telegraphing. If somebody is walking down the street, and all of a sudden they uh, move into what we call blading. Uh, where you make yourself, instead of squaring off to somebody, you kind of turn to one side, yep. uh, set your weight back on your back foot, and you, you're, you're getting your, you know, your hands go up in fists. One looks like you're talking on the telephone. The other one looks like you're singing into a microphone. That person wants to, wants to fight you. Uh, that's a, a universal stance. Now, obviously, I'm reducing that to the ridiculous. But uh, what I'm talking about with gait analysis is <clears throat> something that is – is brand new. This is emerging, and it's not proven science yet. It's it's something that uh, when Eric asked me what is what is some of the cool stuff that, that that we get to know about or that we get to play with, this gait analysis analysis thing is something that I'm watching with considerable interest. That's really cool stuff. I I actually read about the gait analysis a while back. I didn't realize that uh, it had advanced this much. 
Um, so, uh, question. Let's say that I was vacationing in sunny Juarez, Mexico or something, and uh, I happened to uh, get kidnapped. What would it what would it cost my family to hire you or your company to retrieve me? So th- we don't have a, a cookie cutter uh, menu for these types of things. And like all operations, it all comes down to intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. We have to uh, sit with the family, interview them, get a whole bunch of information. And this is a process where we build uh, a profile on the case on whether or not this is something that we can solve. And if it is, then what it's going to take us to solve it based on what we think the issue is and how we think we're going to solve it based on our own best practices or best practices of our peer group in this industry. And, and then we're going to job cost it. Like any organization that operates, uh, we're going to look at the, the factors of what it's going to cost for us to get the outcome that the client expects. And then um, and we're going to build a proposal based on that. And the interesting thing about our process on how we do these things is we always have the client involved in the, um, in the intelligence component of the operation. The reason why is because it's going to take so much time and so much money for individuals at Halo to get up to speed on this guy's history or you're in this scenario because you're clearly in Juarez for your honeymoon uh, because it's you know such a beautiful uh, location <laughs> for these types of things. Um, uh, you know, w- w- there's so many facts of your life and facts of your spouse's life and all of your hobbies and all kinds of little subtle nuances that come into play that we might miss. So we do involve a POC, uh, a point of contact at the family, at the corporation, in this scenario, your wedding planner, somebody who knows you really, really well. And uh, we allow them to not only see the data, but in many, in many cases, we allow them to drive the operation to a certain degree uh, because they just know so much more about the, the, the landscape than, than we as outsiders, as strangers, uh, could even dream, no matter what our training is, no matter what our background might be. Now, we do this in a collaborative way, but we really uh, invite the client in to help because they are an intelligence node that we need to exploit in order to get this, uh, in order to get you uh, a, a back from from whatever situation you're in. Mm-hmm. So it sounds just like any other consulting gig. You have to analyze it, see what it's going to take to complete the job, what type of resources, gather all your information, and then just bill accordingly. Absolutely. Yeah, we, except we there, into- as I say, except if you bring your wife to Juarez, Mexico for your honeymoon, you deserve it. <laughs> so I don't think your family or any of us are going to send any money to save you at all. So, <laughs> I mean, did you see that special that Brad did on on Juarez, Mexico? I did. Yeah, that's why I said. Yeah, I okay. Juarez. Just watch that, and then if you go there after that, I don't know. Yeah, you, he's got problems, right, Brad? <laughs> uh, yeah, that we um, any of our clients that that operate in in any of these high risk transit zones, the first thing that we tell them is, don't go there. Right. Let me save you. Let me yeah. save you a whole lot of money. Uh, don't go there. And then when they just kind of chuckle and say, "Ha ha ha!" Well, gee, we've got our entire uh, we've got our entire manufacturing and distribution uh, hub there. Everything is there. We have to be there. We just opened a new plant. We've got 300 employees. We must go. And then that's when I pass over a love note in the form of an invoice and say, <laughs> "Okay, well, you've invested that much over here. You should have no problem uh, paying our fee." Do you ever um, do you ever worry about your own uh, safety and security, or the safety and security of your family? I mean, being high profile and the type of business that your company is in. I mean, has there any ever been any type of retribution against you or attempted retribution um, since you are kind of in the spotlight now with with the TV show and and whatnot? Sure, um, of course that that has happened uh, prior to the the TV show. Uh, let's look at some of the, the basic fundamental business practices. The, the folks that don't like us very much are in business to make money. If we uh, are doing things that, that chokes off that revenue stream, we're bad for business. So they clearly want us 
uh, to go away. Uh, and then, of course, with the television show, that just um, sort of increased the uh, uh, the amount of discontent that, that might exist in some of these areas that are that are featured on the show. And um, and people and organizations and representative of, uh, representatives of organizations have uh, have contacted us in some pretty creative ways to express their their discontent to our. Uh, through our suggestion box. Brad, we really, um, I'm just looking at the time like, man, wow, we, we got in such a good conversation. I didn't even realize how much of your time we took. Uh, I promised to take an hour and we took an hour and a half. So <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to take your whole day. But um, man, I tell you, that, that uh, some of the stuff you said really was interesting. And what I find amazing um, is how similar our industries are in many aspects, although the way that you do your job and, of course, what you have to do for it are completely different than what we do. But it just seems like we're, we experience a lot of the same uh, the same uh, problems, I should say, or struggles in our business models. So uh, uh, quite interesting, really. So um, if, if our listeners want to find out more about you or about Halo, wh- where can they go to follow you? Or do you have uh, social media websites, Twitter accounts? What kind of things can people do to follow you? Well, the best way is to reach us at the uh, through the website, and um, that's uh, thehalocorp.com, T-H-E-H-A-L-O-C-O-R-P.com. And there's a, a bunch of different ways where you can uh, reach any member of our staff or, or myself if you have more questions or want some more detail. Obviously, we covered a lot of ground today on this call, but there's so much more that we can do offline or privately and there's a, a bunch of information on the website about who we are and what we do and and um, we'd love to talk to your listeners and um, you can sign up for our magazine which is a, a virtual magazine called The Harbinger uh, that is also on our website. People can get um, news and articles and videos that we believe are current and relevant to a lot of the things that we talked about today and we have some of the best subject matter experts on these issues that contribute articles uh, to that magazine every month. And um, it also will uh, show our our schedule of where people can uh, come to some of our training. Yeah, that, actually, I'm glad you brought up the magazine because I've been um, subscribed to it for a couple months now. And even though we're in separate industries, different industries, I find it very interesting. And um, that's good to hear that you have training for the public because I think a lot of our listeners who are not part of the law enforcement might be interested in learning more about some type of training they can have uh, and take. And then I think also um, we do have a lot of law enforcement listeners. So if we, if for those who are listening to us that are from government or law enforcement within this country, within the U.S., uh, how can they contact you about any training that you might have that you don't advertise? Largely the same way uh, through uh, the website. We vet most of the uh, folks that want to come to those things through their contracting officer or, or through their their uh, their uh, training director at their uh, academy or agency or uh, military base, and uh, and then we would contact them if they want to come to any of our training. We coordinate that through their command. Excellent. Okay, so I will make sure that I put the uh, URL to your site on on our podcast notes. And um, if you do send over that information that you have on this gate research, I'm sure that not only myself but our listeners will find this really, really interesting. And uh, Brad, I can't thank you enough for for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Um, Really nice time chatting with you and and learning about your industry. It's it's been my pleasure. I want to continue to be a a resource to you as um, uh, you're saying our our industries and their similarities. I think you'll find over the next, uh, uh, next few years there will be a pretty significant convergence between what you do with your organizations and affiliations and, and what we do. It's, um, they're all headed the same way, and uh, we're all going to be in, in this, on the same road very shortly. Excellent. Right, well, thanks a lot, Brad. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Well, another great podcast. Uh, some heavy stuff this guy had to talk about, huh? I mean, the way that they go into it. Different countries, all commando style, saving yeah. people from kidnapping. That was amazing. Not really, um, uh, you know, I was listening to him in, in the beginning, trying to figure out how we were going to go into the social engineering angle, but it seemed to fit quite nicely at the end, especially knowing uh, what he said at that one point, that that information 
was probably part of the most important aspects of their of of what they do you know spending more time in collecting data and intel than they do in actually launching the attack and uh, i find that to be the case in se of course when we do our gigs you know how we'll spend 60 percent of our time doing information gathering and people who aren't in the field don't you know, they don't realize that. I think it's all like breaking into a company or, you know, just getting dressed up in your UPS outfit and dropping a, a key off somewhere or something. They don't realize that before you get to that stage, 60% of your time is spent in just gathering intel and learning about the company before you can launch any attack. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting to see that we had such similarities in between our two industries, despite the fact that we're totally opposite when it comes to our, our industries and what we do. Yeah, I thought the gate analysis was really interesting also when he was talking about, you know, he, different everybody's gate is a unique identifier and I the, the implications. Yeah, I definitely want to read more on that. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'm a, like you, I just got excited about that part. No, yeah, I was just going to say that it's really interesting because you can analyze from a distance, you know, as opposed to having to collect biometric information from somebody by, you know, scanning their iris or taking their thumbprint or something. I mean, it's something that can be done completely without their knowledge. I really want to read the research on that because I guess like my curiosity is how does tiredness or let's say someone's jogging, you know, you're a runner um, and, and, and that morning you pull your hamstring. Uh, I, I'm sure that will affect your gait, you know, in, yeah. in your walk. So, you know, let's say you were observing me and day one, you know, I'm walking all confident, got no leg problems. The next day I, I pulled my hamstring and now when you're observing me again, my gait is completely changed. You know, are there telltale signs that someone has when it comes to their gait that are always consistent regardless of injury? You know, kind of like facial expressions, um, or or is it you know is it not that unique? I really really want to read the research on that and see how how they're using that for identifier. Yeah, and I think that opens it up also. Is if you can understand that, then is it possible to like obfuscate your gait or to hmm. you know show some sort of gait that's not yours? Right, it's like all Kaiser yeah. Soze. The yeah, suspects. yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, didn't he straighten all up at the end? And yep. oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know, that was became a completely the, different person. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that was one of the greatest movies. And that scene in particular was just great. I mean, what a great way to end that movie. Yeah, you know, a lot of movies like that, you, when you're uh, watching them, you can tell, you, can, you know what the ending's going to be. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know that this is going to happen or that's really the bad guy. You kind of have a guess. That's one of those movies, at least for me, throws you uh, off a spin. Yeah, you know, totally. No, no clue who the bad guy was. And you're like, what? You know, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty that, cool. Actually, that whole movie was about social engineering, wasn't it? It was definitely uh, had a lot of SE spin in that movie, if you ask me. Wow, well before it's time. Well before. Well before. We should do a dissertation on it. We should take apart that whole movie. You know, I had a couple other people that were saying that we should go through and pick out movies like Sneakers. You know, Sneakers was an SE-based movie. And, of course, a lot of movies that have SE in them are unrealistic. But to, to like, take apart movies like that and see what's real, what's not, what we can learn from, what's accurate, and especially the timing. You know, like, look at something like Sneakers that is – when was that made? It had to be 80s? Yep. Right? And then something like um, The Unusual Suspects, which is, what, early 90s? Yep. So, you know, look at the difference between those two movies and see what has changed over time and, and, and at least Hollywood and also the methods that are being portrayed as being realistic or used. As Sneakers, a, Sneakers was a 92 release. Yeah, and what, there was another movie. Um, Hackers? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Okay, you need, to you need to fire yourself. Um, Again? Okay, you know, it had Nick, it had, uh, wait, who's the guy... Nicholas Cage in it, and he played um, this guy who was a scam artist that had like OCD, matchstick men. Oh yeah. Okay, that movie was S E to the Supreme. S E to the. If you haven't seen it, I'm not going to blow it for you. You got to go watch it. That was a great. the The girl in that movie, epic, epic uh, S E, was a really, right. really good movie. I, I enjoyed it highly. I'm adding it to my Netflix now. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely take a see a view of that. That was a good, good flick. That would be a kind of a cool little um, podcast, huh? We all watch a different movie about SE and then talk about. Yeah, maybe that would be an idea that we can 
toss around. Totally off topic about Brad and the Halo Corporation. I wonder, you know, it would be kind of cool uh, if we never really got a idea from him, even though I know uh, Eric asked a couple different ways what the cost was. <laughs> yeah, I was you know? really trying to figure that out. Yeah, you know, I know you tried. You tried a couple different ways, and he did a good job at evading your, your question. But yep. I think it's it's like anything else in consulting where it's really hard to quantify how many hours are you going to have to do until gathering? Is the person honest or not? And you know how... I, I think in those situations, like you said, people are so emotional when they finally come to him and they've done all sorts of things that you're like, well, is it 10 hours of intel gathering we're going to have to do or is it going to be 100 hours of intel gathering before we actually get down to what the real problem is? Yeah. And I think it just varies. It, it'd be interesting to know what their hourly consulting rate is, though. So. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we were thinking of you know, getting Eric kidnapped and then having them come and rescue him so we can learn from those guys. That would be a great uh, exercise for sure. Yeah, you know. Maybe send me down to Columbia or something. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you thinking. don't need to go that far. You can just go to Juarez, Mexico. <laughs> there you go. Go to Juarez for your honeymoon. I know you were sunny, mentioning that. In the sunny Juarez, Mexico. Yeah. 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 Take your wife Where there's to like supposedly there's 30, there's one death a day attributed to the narco terrorist war. Wow. Last year. Or, so 30 deaths, at least 30 deaths a month times 12. Or maybe That's I can all. convince Black Hat to take you to Abu Dhabi with them and then we can, you know, arrange for some government <laughs> no, insulting well, propaganda in your bag or something. I think they this will is, just, yeah. you know, if he shows up in the Middle East as, a, as dressed, cross-dressed, I think they'll just throw him out of the country. You think? Or maybe yeah, just not even let me in. They won't let him in. What a, they would just get to passport control and they'll just turn him away. What if he tries to uh, smuggle booze in? Well, liquor is not illegal. Oh, man. You know, I saw this. You ever see the show Locked Up Abroad? No. Oh, gosh. Okay. I try not to. <laughs> no, so th- this show, I-, I watch it. Just- when was this? I'm going to now go TV this. Yes. Okay, so it's on Discovery, right? You can and, Netflix it. And and this this show's ridiculous. So so he so here's all these people who are like down and out, you know, they, they have like a crappy life, maybe going through divorce, whatever. And it just so happens that somebody approaches them and says, Hey, I got a business proposition for you. I'll pay you, you know, ten grand to go to Mexico and bring back this vest full of cocaine. Whatever. How stupid can you possibly be? Right. So they do it and they don't get caught. So then they get a little cocky and they do it five, six more times. And usually it's like that seventh time when they're bringing back double the weight limit because they're, get, they're happy with all the money they're making that they get caught and they end up in prison. Now, normally it's really dumb stuff. You know, it's like, you know, someone transporting cocaine, heroin, hash, whatever, and they end up in these prisons and then they, you know, it takes them like they have like 50 year sentences and the government and the family fights. And after seven years, they get released. But they're telling their story about how horrible these these prisons were. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. You know, they interview prison guards and blah, blah, blah. So I'm watching one the other night and it's about Saudi Arabia. And this guy gets asked by the government to go over and do uh, he's a chef from Scotland and he's doing his chefing over there and cooking. And he gets invited to all these like Western parties um, and in the parties, they always have booze, and it's really crappy, nasty booze that nobody likes. Um, but you know, it's illegal. But they, so they have it. Well, he decides since he's a caterer and a chef, he can buy large quantities of juice and sugar and yeast, and no one's going to look the other way. And he starts this booze making business. So he's now making like sixty gallons of wine a week, churning it out in these big jugs, and then attaching it to the inside of his um, massive trucks. Um, you know engine compartment and transporting it to these parties and of course loving the money he's got like a half a million bucks under his mattress dating this girl these guys from uh, Bahrain approach him and say hey we want you to start bringing whiskey in so he brings whiskey in and gets caught and the guy ends up in this like horrendous horrible Middle Eastern prison you know getting the living crap beat out of him every day uh, for having 10 cases of scotch you know that that the that he was selling to government officials. So the government officials were buying it from him and drinking it, <laughs> and then one guy oh didn't gosh. like it and turned him in. Got the guy arrested. Any I don't know what any of that has to do with our podcast and why I'm bringing this all up on the podcast. But I was thinking we can plant something like that on Eric when he goes to the Middle East. <laughs> That's a really long, drawn out story to tell you this that portion. 
that whole the whole story was just to get me arrested. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, that's it. Have you seen the movie uh, Maria Full of Grace? No. If you guys haven't seen that movie, I would highly recommend it. It's about a woman who becomes a mule and starts uh, smuggling drugs into the United States from Colombia, I think. And uh, it's a very riveting uh, movie. Riveting. You don't hear too many movies described as that. Yeah, that's the way I roll. Yeah. You've been (laughs) hanging out with Siskel and Ebert? Yes. Yes. Riveting. I can tell. That movie was riveting. It's playing on Thursday at uh, on December first at three a.m. I'm now going to record it on my TiVo. What Maria, full of grace? Yes. It's Look playing. at that taking my uh, recommendations. It's playing where on TV or on 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 TV on cable. Huh. Oh, cable. Yeah. yeah, we don't get yeah. that where I'm from. You have Netflix, don't you? I'm just kidding. Or is yes. that or, or does the post o- post office doesn't get that far either? We don't have the, we don't have the internets here. <laughs> <laughs> the interwebs. <laughs> the interwebs. Those tubes don't travel to this part of the U.S. There's a I guy. know. It's, well, it's awesome that your tin can and string works so clearly. It does. Yeah, there's a guy on my front porch playing the banjo right now. But <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how far from reality that really is. So, so do you have animals and things there on, on your two acres? Are you, <laughs> in, you know, Do you have a farm? or? I have a dog. Okay. And I Who's have... Like a horse. No, no, I don't. I don't have animals like that. Yeah, I'm not like social engineer slash farmer. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> by the day I up. se people. By night I milk my cows. You know? <laughs> that could be that could be a new good business proposition. You know, whether you need se or cow milking, I'm your guy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely cutting that out of the podcast, just so you know. <laughs> Omg. Yes. So I think we've reached a point where there's not much more to say on this podcast. I agree. I agree. So, uh, in conclusion, let's say uh, if you want to check us out, it's social-engineer.org or social-engineer.com. On the irc.freenode.net network, we are channel social-engineer. On Twitter, we're human hacker. Uh, you can keep sending in your ideas and uh, any newsletter articles. We actually have a couple that were submitted uh, from just listeners and readers of our newsletter, so we might be using some of them. Really great to see people in the community reaching out for that. Again, if you like the music on the outro, check out dualcoremusic.com, and uh, we will talk to you guys next month. See ya. It's the SE derivative. That's me, I'm prime. The last thing I want is suspicion of a crime. My positive demeanor and my smile make it fine. With eye contact for the right amount of time. Too much and not enough doesn't seem for real. Got a nice firm handshake sealing the deal. Know a little about a lot and a lot about a little. So most conversations put me somewhere in the middle. My pop culture knowledge leaves me feeling kind of scary. It lets me chat with working class and gossip secretaries. Recon the boardroom, looking for the top thing. Loosen up execs when I ask about the golf swing. Start spewing secrets Just like a torrent Can't really blame them We all want to feel important It might seem different From what you were envisioning The key to communicate Is all about the listening I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best to get you, get you I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best Offering support to employees is the best When I'm calling random users and claiming I'm a tech He's just here to help So they're easily believing him Jamming, planning, scamming, spanning every single medium Recording while I'm spidering your phone menu system The mirror written, use it for my own acquisition Get them on the line, I just do a little switching Sending out my number in the message when I'm fishing Six billion people, it's really quite a market Customers, employees, everyone's a target Backing up my claims, using all the common slang Lingo for the layout, drop the manager Name. Collecting all the sweet stuff like honey to a bumblebee Like every unlisted number dial to your company You saw me, you probably think I'm clumsy, but I'm not Cause I'm dropping all these USB drives around the parking lot Oh, uh, whoops I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best to get you, get you I'm gonna use every trick in the book I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked I'm